Thanks very much, Kate. And it's great to be on this panel. And thanks to the uh, previous speakers. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a very, hopefully a very productive and good discussion about what we're doing. Just a word or two about Stop the War. We've been in existence since just after 9-11, since the um, just before the war on Afghanistan, which of course is still going on, and then the war in Iraq and all the other uh, military adventures that our government has gone into with the United States government and a number of others. So we're very committed to opposing all wars, the existing ones, I'm sure everybody shares the same feeling about this, but also this threat to the new Cold War and obviously behind the new Cold War, the danger of a hot war at some point uh, with China. And uh, I think, you know, you, if you look at, and again, the colleagues in the United States obviously know this much, much better than me, but not only have you got Trump who is both trying to damage China economically, we've seen with all sorts of things, trade wars, tariffs, the most latest with TikTok, but also to increase the threat militarily to China. And we, and we see this in a whole range of ways, most recently, um, the whole question of Taiwan and uh, the arms deal with, uh, with Taiwan, which uh, the United States has agreed, but also the, the way in which they're spending money on armaments with a very strong sense of this being about confrontation with China, both in terms of upgrading their Navy and also in terms of the eye-wateringly, what is it, $1.3 trillion that they're talking about developing new nuclear warheads, which are aimed at this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of conflict. So these are very, very serious questions and are ones which I think that for all of us, we have to be very uh, aware of and we have to be very conscious that we, we cannot just watch this happening. Uh, both, uh, both Julie and Margaret have referred to the kind of media in the US and the way in which you hear one side of the story and not the other sides of the story. In Britain, it's probably not yet quite as bad as this, although there's just been announced an attempt to set up a new sort of uh, television channel modeled on Fox News, which uh, won't be good news for anybody. Um, but there are, there are similar issues with the way in which all of these things are reported. And there's also, as we know in the United States, and this is true, unfortunately, for a large section of the uh, leadership of the British Labour Party at the moment, there's quite a bipartisan approach to this. This isn't just that you've got Trump to worry about. Whatever happens in the election, Biden has also said that you know Trump has been rolling over for China and uh, not dealing with it, with it sufficiently. And of course, there's the danger of anti-Chinese racism, which has grown quite substantially in terms of people blaming China for the virus, although why people in Britain or the United States would feel that somehow they've done a better job of dealing with the coronavirus than, than China did is beyond me. I don't, uh, I don't quite understand where that comes from. So you've got these, these very serious questions and ones that if you look at the British government in, in addition to the United States government, there's definitely been an escalation in terms of rhetoric, in terms of tension, and in terms of intention, of, in terms of what they want to do over the next few years. Now, uh, therefore, I think it's, it's vital that we have a movement against this kind of escalation. Um, we, uh, in Stop the War, we've always taken the position that we want to unite the widest number of people uh, possible against any threat by by our government these are this is the um uh the area that we always concentrate on we concentrate on what the british government is doing and what its role is uh and so on and we take the view as well and we always have done with all the different uh conflicts that have gone on that we unite people regardless of what their view might be of the country under threat. And there's a whole range of different views about China and as there are about Iraq or about Libya or anywhere else. And I think it's important that we do as an anti-war movement that we make that clear. Our action is not about saying we agree 100% with everything that goes on in China. It's not about that. Although again, if you look at questions like Hong Kong, you do kind of wonder at the British government going on about democracy when it controlled Hong Kong as a colony. For, uh, for many, many years. But 
It's about saying we should all be able to unite, regardless of our position, against a war which will be of absolutely devastating consequences to the people of China, to the people of the United States, to the people of the whole world. So that's the basis on which we do it. And I think that we need to be able to find ways of highlighting this thing. For example, the new, the only aircraft carrier um, that is in use at the moment in Britain, the HMS uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth is going on its first excursion to the South China Sea and therefore is directly going to be involved in any tensions and any possible military escalation going on there. And I think we should find ways of protesting about this, of demanding that we're not used in this kind of way, that the vast amounts of money spent on this are, uh, are not going to be in order to highlight or in order to escalate war anywhere. So I think that we can do that. I think we also have to have an ideological argument about um, why war is wrong and why we don't want to go to war with China and the role of British imperialism, which is a very long role, the role of uh, US imperialism at the moment. And those are important things for us as well. I also feel that the whole question of the cost of war, when we have this huge health crisis, when we have this huge economic crisis, when we have all these things going on, then I think it is absolutely incumbent on us to say that why should the people of some of the richest countries in the world suffer as a result of this military conflict, this escalation of arms spending and, uh, and the threat of future wars. So all of those things are important to us. Finally, I'd just like to say, I would like to uh, think that, and I'm sure everybody here will agree with this, that actually we have to link some of these issues up, that we have wars at the present in countries like Yemen, there's still a war going on in Syria, there's still conflict in, uh, in Iraq, in Libya, and, and so on. We can, you know, we know that the sanctions against many countries in the world, uh, including Venezuela, for example, um, these are issues that I think we have to begin to make the links. There's constant threats towards Iran. There's the new deal in, uh, in the Middle East between the UAE and Israel, which will lead to further conflict and all of these will not be separate from this question of a um, of a new cold war they'll be put they will help to fuel uh, a new cold war so just to conclude on that and to conclude also that just two well one other issue I think that we need to constantly have in our minds and that is the question of racism and how wars fuel racism I, I referred to the anti-chinese racism but we know with the Muslims uh, in countries like France, the United States, Britain, uh, the level of Islamophobia has greatly escalated in very large part because of these wars. So these are all issues. Very happy to be here today. And I think we can find all these issues which can unite us in order to stop this uh, growing fear of a new Cold War. Thank you very much.